Zoom, I will usually freeze for about 30 seconds at one point during the meeting. It happens once. It also happens when I watch Hulu shows. It doesn't happen when I watch Netflix shows for some weird reason, but um, Zoom <laughs> and Hulu, I freeze. If I come back, um, so hopefully I'll freeze in a, if I do, if I do um, hopefully it'll be an entertaining face at least, um, but I'll, I will return. Okay, and then uh, when, we, when we begin, uh, I'll mute everybody uh, but yourself. And, Amazing. Uh, you know, so that uh, we don't have any background noise. Please stop that. Okay, it's, it's 8.02, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to mute everybody other than uh, uh, you, Rabbi, and we'll go from there. Sounds great. Okay. I'm going to mute myself there. Okay. <laughs> right, 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 right. Go, please. That's all right. Um, so uh, thank you for inviting me to speak to you all today. Um, what I was thinking would happen is I would just share a few thoughts. Um, I was asked by Alan to um, come in after a recent article I wrote for Alma, which is a feminist Jewish publication online. Um, I believe actually Dr. Mandel, you might've recommended it. Um, and I uh, wanted to share a few thoughts based on what I talked about there, then open it up for discussion. Um, I think the way that it was explained to me is that usually uh, you have somebody speak for a little while and then uh, we open up to a bit of discussion for about uh, 45 minutes or so. Does that, sound, does that sound right? Yeah? Great. Awesome. Um, so welcome everyone. I am Rabbi Stephen Philp. I am one of uh, the rabbis at Park Avenue Synagogue in New York on the Upper East Side. Um, I've been there for about a year. I just passed my one year mark. Um, and graduated from rabbinical school last year. Um, and so uh, it's, been a, it's been a good journey so far, um, but I'm really uh, uh, glad to be here with all of you, um, especially at this time in which I think connection across communities is so important um, and these opportunities to come together and to uh, connect a bit around an issue of importance at our time is just a, a really an opportunity I, I relish um, and a blessing as well. So I want to begin by talking a little bit about history um, and really the remembrance of history for us as a people, for us as a Jewish community um, is an imperative that I um, think is emphasized by the weight of repetition. We find the commandment to remember in the Torah repeated 169 times, um, which, is, which is quite a lot. Uh, for a single word, for a single command, zahor, to remember, to be repeated over and over and over again. Um, and I believe that the reason that memory serves as this foundational commandment for us is that it, it helps us understand, first and foremost, our covenant with the divine. And we can think of a lot of different commands throughout the Torah that is either um, appended by um, or it begins with um, the statement from God, I am the one who brought you out of Egypt. Do this um, in part because you remember the history of our relationship. And really the Torah itself is a documentation of that history. Um, the command to remember also weaves its way through our liturgy. Um, we sanctify Shabbat in the memory of both the Exodus um, and that first Shabbat of creation as well. And it also helps structure our ritual lives. Think about, for example, the Passover Seder, we reenact and therefore place ourselves within the foundational narrative of our people. Um, and in this way, that reenactment is also a reliving. We don't just say, remember that time when our ancestors were slaves in Egypt, we say, avadim hayinu, right? We ourselves um, were slaves in the land of Egypt. We have experienced this oppression firsthand. Um, one of my favorite uh, theologians, Arthur Cohen, talks about how we as Jews um, our identity is formed both through the recollection of the past and anticipation of the future. And we can think about how every ritual that we do has both an element of bringing the past into the present as an indication of where we're going in the future. 
Jewish identity forms because um, we place ourselves within this narrative, but not necessarily in a linear pattern, but in a way in which we are simultaneously living both the past and the future. Another example I like to think of is Shabbat. Uh, we observe Shabbat, uh, we rest because God rested on the seventh day. Um, that's what we say within our mythical narrative of creation. And we also rest in anticipation of the messianic age. And we also rest because we're in our present moment of Shabbat. So we see how past and present and future all link with each other and in doing so help shape what it means to be um, as a Jew in the world. So most people, um, and I say most people because I myself am a convert, so I chose, I chose Judaism, um, but most people are born into communities of others who are like them. Uh, and so most, for most individuals, uh, the acquisition of their community's history comes through the formal mechanisms of education, like day schools or uh, religious school as well, attending services, um, attending cultural events, and also through the informal structures that help shape and our lives, um, such as customs, uh, recipes, uh, stories around the campfire, right? sitting with your relatives and listening about their own history or listening to them explain the significance of the moment in history to you. Um, we actually get to experience through our communities a sense of lived history and experience. Um, either the memories of the people who are speaking to us or maybe the memories that they are recalling on behalf of somebody else. And I imagine all of us can think of a moment in which somebody in our family said, oh yeah, you know, you're studying World War II. Well, I remember when, you know, your grandfather, your father, your relative, you know, it was also experienced that in real time, right? And the history becomes lived in that way. Um, and we can keep, you know, thinking about how that extends throughout uh, this chain of tradition I mean, in some ways, right, when we read the Torah, it's almost like getting that secondhand account, like, oh yeah, remember our ancestor Moses? He actually lived that history, right? Um, and so we get to experience that ourselves. Um, and then for those of us who also belong to majority culture, and not necessarily majority Christian culture, but perhaps it is, um, you know, that our uh, gender identity aligns with a majority gender identity, such as identifying as male, um, we also see this history, this inheritance, um, this kind of how-to further reflected and reaffirmed in the people we see on television, um, in the stories we see in movies, um, in the way that billboards might reflect our face back to us in some ways. And we say, oh yeah, that person, I can identify with that person. They are also helping shape this idea of who I am. But um, this is not true uh, for many, many, many LGBTQ people. Um, when I say LGBTQ, it's uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. Um, sometimes we add on more letters. Um, generally, we um, have now started to use queer as a catch-all term, but it's not a perfect catch-all. Um, but I'm talking about individuals whose sexual orientation or gender identity is different from the heterosexual or cisgender norm. And when I say cisgender, I mean somebody who is assigned the gender at birth, which they identify with later in life. Um, so for those of us who don't fall into that category, for those of us who are part of the LGBTQ community, we're often one of few, if not like the only member of our families who are LGBTQ, right? And so imagine for a second, um, for maybe those of you who are born to the Jewish community, if you came out of the womb a Jew, um, but nobody else in your family was Jewish, right? Like where do you, where do you learn the values of, of what it means to be a Jew? Where do you gain that history. Um, so for LGBTQ individuals, we actually grow up disconnected from our history. Um, and so to gain that history, we actually have to choose to seek it out. Um, the caveat I want to add here, though, is that this has started to change with increasing acceptance in the media of queer characters and storylines. Um, but this is, this is rare. Um, it, it's a lot more now than it was. I've, I've, in my own lifetime, has seen right this massive shift in acceptance in the mainstream media. Um, but with notable exceptions like um, A Normal Heart or Milk, the Harvey Milk biopic, I don't know if anybody got to see those in theaters or um, streamed online, very little of the queer narrative that exists in mainstream media is actually reflective of our history as a people. Um, they're often fictionalized narratives. So, 
we must choose this history ourselves. And I was really lucky. Um, my first year of college, um, I went to USC as an undergrad in Los Angeles. I don't know if I have any fellow Trojans here. Um, my first year of college, I had a professor um, who helped me access this history. He sat me down and he said, Stephen, you are um, too smart, uh, too uh, sensitive to be disconnected from your history. And I believe that it's actually your obligation as a young member of the LGBTQ community to learn your people's history. Um, but it really wasn't. He gave me an amazing reading list and I, I, I poured through it and I learned a lot. Um, but it really wasn't until my final years of rabbinical school, many years later, when I interned for Congregation Beit Simchat Torah here in New York, the largest LGBTQ synagogue in the world, um, that I actually began to experience history as it was lived and remembered. I actually got to sit down with people who participated in the emergence of LGBTQ history, who um, not only inherited stories from people, but also lived these stories, who remembered the Stonewall riots, who remembered um, the boycott of, of uh, Miller and certain other products, who remembered um, right, the first court cases going through um, the lower courts, um, who remembered the in-state um, uh, the uh, passing of DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Amendment, who remembered its overturning. Um, right? These are people who lived this history um, and who kept the stories of our community alive. And the question they asked, and the question I started to ask is, well, who will be the keepers of our memory? You know, where are the rituals, the stories, um, the moments in our own lived experience, in our daily practice that help us keep this memory? So I believe that Judaism, and the reason I think one of the reasons I became a Jew and chose Judaism is that our tradition is grounded in this deep, deep call toward empathy. We understand the soul of the stranger, as we're told, um, because we have been strangers ourselves. Um, and I believe that this is one of the reasons we regularly revisit history, even um, as Tisha B'Av, which is in a few weeks, teaches us the really painful parts of our history. And we don't just celebrate our victories, but we revisit the really broken and difficult moments of our past on a very regular basis. And I think one of the purposes of this is to reignite um, and to reify um, this part of ourselves who remembers what it is to be a stranger. Um, by revisiting these old wounds, by going back uh, to slavery in Egypt, by going back to our exile in Babylon, by going back to um, our experience of the Crusades and the pogroms and the Shoah, um, by going back to these difficult moments and reliving them, right? As I said earlier, our ritual is not just a remembering, but a reenactment. Um, I think we open ourselves up um, and attune ourselves to the pain and brokenness that might exist around us. It's to kind of rebuild that empathic muscle, to reignite it. Um, which then allows us to say that we may no longer be slaves in Egypt, thank God, Dayenu, um, but our memory of oppression attunes us to where slavery continues to exist around us. Um, and this is also why I think that we as Jews have stood on the front lines of every major American civil rights movement in our country's history, which is pretty remarkable. You can think of, of Jews who are on the front lines of the civil rights movement, Jews who are on the front lines of abolition, um, suffrage, uh, the LGBTQ rights movement as well. Um, we've, we've played a role um, in helping move these movements along. And I think part of that is that even when that's not our community, there's a part of us that is ignited when we see the pain of others. And so we come to this year. Um, pride rolls around. Um, it was last month, although I have to say pride is, pride is all month, but uh, or all year long. Um, you can always celebrate pride no matter what time of the year you find yourself in, but um, we traditionally celebrate pride during the month of June. Um, and this year, it looks different. Um, it was more important than ever this year, I think, because of COVID, and I think particularly because of the movement for Black Lives. Um, that the roots of pride are not the rainbow lined streets and glittering spectacle that we, um, at least in New York, have become very used to. Um, but the roots of pride and the reason we always um, have the March in New York that last weekend of June um, is because that's the anniversary of the Stonewall riots. Um, to remember that pride started um, as a rebellion on a, on a hot summer evening in June 1969 when a group of our most marginalized members of our community took a stand against brutality. Um, 
At the time, uh, it, these establishments, LGBTQ establishments, were often raided by police. And this, uh, this night in June was uh, not, not unlike other nights where this happened. And the first people to stand up, the first people who said, no, this can't happen anymore, were Marsha P. Johnson, a, a black drag queen, Zazu Nova, a black trans woman, Jackie Hormona, a white sex worker, uh, Stormy Delavery, a biracial butch lesbian, Sylvia Rivera, a Latinx drag queen. These were the people who stood up first. And I have to think that maybe the reason that those are the people who stood up first to this brutality, who, who rather than giving into that hopelessness and fear that had accompanied so many of these police raids, maybe it was because they knew, maybe even more than their white or cisgender counterparts in the LGBT community, they knew what it was like to be marginalized. And the pain they saw around them ignited something in them. They said that your pain is also my pain, which I think is a deeply Jewish thing to say, even though none of these individuals, I believe, were actually were Jews. But there's a deeply Jewish thing to say, um, to identify, to empathize with that pain. Um, and so they refused to turn away. And that, and that first fist that was thrown, that first brick that was tossed at the police wagon, that first smashed glass, I think was, was motivated just as much by their own personal indignation and pain as it was by the pain of their entire community, um, by witnessing, um, by reigniting that part of themselves that felt that. And so here we are. Um, we're no longer in Pride Month, as I said, but we are still grappling um, with um, deep inequality in this country when it comes to LGBTQ issues. And unfortunately, over the past year or so, a, a, a huge backsliding um, in our rights, particularly around um, trans and non-binary individuals. Um, um, we have seen a few steps forward. The recent Supreme Court ruling certainly is one of them, but we've seen a lot of, a lot of the chipping away um, at, at these small victories we've accumulated over the past couple decades. Um, and then also, too, we're grappling with the fact that this country has a deeply racist history. Um, we are not all equal um, as much as we might aspire to be. Um, and so right now, I think, is an opportunity to remember this history, not just as LGBTQ people, not just as Jews, but as uh, members of this human community. Um, but I think particularly for us, um, for those of us who by our tradition, by God, by um, the weight of history, whatever, whatever is the thing that motivates you in your Judaism, um, we, are, we are called to dig deeply into our past and to say that I know the soul of the stranger um, because we were strangers in the land of Egypt. I know what it's like to stand on the margins because we have stood on the margins. Um, and I think it's up to each of us right now, um, as complicated as these issues might be, uh, to find the part of ourselves that resonates with and recognizes the pain of people of color, whether we are people of color ourselves or white, um, who recognizes their anger and also aligns with their vision for a better world. Um, because that is, in the end, what our empathy should call us towards, is that prophetic call towards justice and a prophetic call um, towards the hope, um, the resolve um, that, that change can come and things can be better. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, I want to open it up to, uh, to discussion. Uh, that was a kind of a summation of some thoughts and, um, and particularly the article I wrote for Alma that I know, um, that I know Alan and, and Dr. Mandel were interested in uh, me sharing. But um, I opened it up. How let me let me try to start the the uh, the question. Mm -hmm. How best can the Jewish community, since we are not going to be able to affect the community at large, uh, how best can the Jewish community uh, bring about the change uh, that uh, you and many people so uh, desperately want? That's <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think really when we're, when we're talking about issues, um, both in the LGBTQ community and also issues of race as well, um, we really need to begin with ourselves. Um, I think we all need to constantly be doing the work of examining our implicit biases. I think no matter how, uh, to, to quote my millennial peers and actually Gen Z, now that I've, I've been phased out of the youngest generation, um, no matter how woke you might be, um, there's always, there's always, always work to be done internally um, to say, 
you know, where, where do I still make assumptions based on people or, or about people based on their the color of their skin or their identity or how they express themselves in the world? Um, how can I continue to dismantle that? Um, a lot of that work, um, the burden I have to say falls on us as individuals. It's not the job of, um, of the people you're thinking of to do the work for you. Um, and I think most people are becoming aware now that um, although we should have individuals from other communities as our thought partners, um, we can't put the burden of our self-improvement on them. Um, you know, it's about actually having to seek out, like I, like I did as a, a, you know, a young gay man in college, I had to seek out that history myself and to do some of that learning on my own. And I obviously had a, a, a self-motivating and um, personally invested reason to do that. Um, but I think that kind of teshuva, right, to, to kind of prep ourselves for the high holidays, that education is really where we start. And then we hopefully can bring our communities along as well. Um, I, I'm always, um, and I don't want to say this um, uh, to, to uh, deny the importance of outward facing um, activism, um, but I also understand that symbolic acts feel really good. Like it feels good to show up to a march. It feels good to do that soup kitchen. It feels really good to write that letter, um, you know, whatever it might be. I think those are really important, but those kinds of symbolic outward facing acts without having done the internal work as well, um, is a, I think a disservice um, to, the, to the good intent behind um, the former, um, behind that kind of outward facing uh, movement. Um, I always think about a lot of communities um, say that they are LGBTQ friendly, for example. Um, and I think on, and for all intents and purposes, everybody there wants that to be true. Um, but then the experience of an LGBTQ person walking into that community might actually not be the best. It might not be the most comfortable because that community didn't take the time to really do the internal work. Um, not that they want to be unwelcoming, uh, but we all, all of us, all of us have implicit biases, um, uh, you know, whether it's about age, race, sexual orientation, national origin, education levels, socioeconomic status, like we all have those biases and we make a lot of assumptions about people. So thank you for asking, yeah. Um, I wanted to, I, I feel really peculiar as being the only woman in this crowd, and I'm actually shocked that there aren't hundreds of people paying attention to this presentation, so thank you all. Yeah. Um, I am one of the early members of another Keshet, which is an international organization supporting individuals and families in the Jewish community with disabilities. And when we started all of that, we um, had hoped, believed that that was a group that everyone would embrace, right? Uh, how can we easily integrate our, in my case, my daughter, um, other family members into an inclusive world? And that took years. So, um, so I think about the ways in which um, these issues of gender identity, sexuality, um, integration into a specific Jewish community. And when you said, what can we, I mean, I believe we can do more than just in the Jewish community. I think we can be all over some of we every day, but but part of us who are part so sorry friend you broke up a little bit at the end there um i think it was your last sentence that i couldn't really quite hear oh i was just saying i was confirming what you said about being we have to be the voice outside the community mm -hmm. as well as um collaborating within that um that those are the ways change are made you know changes are made i also think i think what, it, what you're bringing what you're bringing to the table here as well is that it takes time um, as, as, as much as it might frustrate us on a variety of issues. And I know that um, as a community, we're still, we're still working on issues of, of embracing those um, with different uh, learning abilities, um, you know, physical disability, you know, it's, we're still working on that. Um, and I can only imagine how deeply frustrating that must be for, for individuals um, who are part of that community and for their loved ones as well. 
Um, I, but I also think, and this is not an excuse, um, but I often think back to that adage we have from Pure Care Votes, um, right? That it's, it's not incumbent on you to finish the work, but neither are we at liberty to desist from it. Um, although we often forget the beginning of that quote is, um, the day is short, um, the work is great, the workers are indolent, the reward is, uh, you know, is what we want, and um, the master is insistent, which is to say life is short, um, you know, there's a lot to do, um, other people are sometimes really difficult, as much as we might love them, um, but the reward for what we, what we desire is, is, is worth pursuing, um, and, and God insists. I really also good. want to give a shout out to, I'm a, I'm a active participant at Anshayamed in Chicago, um, as well as you know, I zoom into uh, Park Avenue to say Kaddish right now. Mm -hmm. Um, cause it's early and, and works well for me, but, <laughs> but I've really appreciated, um, words of Torah that you have shared and your team in general, but I am part of a community here that's rich in its advocacy and desire to be better at this all the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm also familiar with Aunt Shamet as well. Um, many, many, many years ago, worked there as part of their uh, religious school um, uh -huh. as, as the art teacher. But um, okay. I think also, too, what, um, what, what we have to recognize is that, you know, we actually have a good model for this. We just read about it, actually. Um, I, Moses leads the people out of Egypt, you know, wanders through the desert for 40 years, um, overcomes many, many, many obstacles. And when he finally reaches the edge of the promised land is, is told that he doesn't get to go. And he doesn't actually get to see the promised land. And, and you can imagine, right, stand, literally standing on the banks of the Jordan River, looking over into the promised land, there might have been some frustration, um, some, some concern, some anger, some, I mean, imagine the, the, there's a lot of different emotions there. But what he does is he says, you know what? Like, I'm gonna designate my successor and I'm going to ensure that the work that I've done um, means something, that somebody is going to get to reach that promised land. Um, and I think back to throughout Jewish history, um, throughout American history, throughout the history of the LGBTQ um, community, um, there's many, many people on whose shoulders we stand um, who never actually got to see the end of their work. Um, a really remarkable person that I um, had the opportunity to work with um, when I was at CBST, it was E.D. Windsor. Um, who was the plaintiff in one of the cases that overturned part of the Defense of Marriage Amendment. Um, what essentially happened is her wife Thea died um, and she was not able to inherit Thea's estate without, um, I guess, capital gains tax. I'm not a tax attorney, I'm sorry, but without severe tax penalties that does not happen when you're married. Um, they had been married in Canada, but their marriage was not recognized on a federal level in the United States. Um, and uh, they didn't get to see the end of the process. Um, you know, it's individuals like that. And there's so many, we can think of so many individuals throughout history who didn't actually get to see the end of the process of the work, the good work that they've done. But how grateful are we that those people didn't give up? Um, and so for us, you know, we may not get to see the end of, of all the work that we hope to achieve. Um, but as Rabbi Tarfon reminds us, you're, you're not at liberty to neglect it. And I, I think the notion of what legacy we leave is also really important. So my nieces and their wives um, are a rich part of our extended family. And my kids daily have interactions in the world that move us forward. So it's on a mac, you know, macro scale, but also in a very micro way. Um, Absolutely. Are we able to facilitate growth? Absolutely. So this is Stephen. I have a question. Um, yeah. We have Tom Sudo is on the phone, who's the international president of FJMC. And one of our missions is promoting equality and mental health, mm -hmm. uh, which is an issue within the um, within all of our communities. And one of our goals is to educate clergy. So I wonder, um, what are your thoughts? And maybe Tom, if if you would sort of project what our mission is of FJMC, that we have Rabbi Philip here, and to that we share the same purpose and the same goals. Mm. Um, so you know, rabbis for a long time, I think, um, served on the front lines 
of mental health in a way that we probably weren't always prepared for. Um, you know, it's, uh, I, I, was, I was very lucky to have um, gone to school for social work. I got my master's in social work and I, um, you know, concentrated um, on mental health counseling, um, which really only, I think, made me realize how, um, how ill-prepared in some ways um, many of us are, um, you know, to address the very real issues that we face. Um, I think that our clergy, we certainly need more support. I mean, it's only been the past um, a decade or so that we've actually required any sort of pastoral education, um, right? Where we're going out as interns into hospitals, into chaplaincy settings and getting on the ground experience being with people at the most difficult times in their lives. But a lot of that learning for many clergy has to come in the field. Um, and I think um, something that all of us need, including those of us like myself who do have mental health backgrounds, um, we need more support, you know? Any, any helping profession, um, particularly in the medical fields, I'm sure many of you can speak to this, right, has continuing education requirements and has opportunities, right, to keep our knowledge sharp and to continually expand that knowledge. Um, I think to, you know, to make those opportunities available would be phenomenal. Um, I would love them, I would sign up. You know, uh, Steve, one of the things that, Grand Rabbi, one of the things that the FJMC has been trying to combat uh, for the last generation is what I call the Shonda factor. Right. Started out with our work around uh, children of intermarried uh -huh. uh, who were being rejected from the community and how can we get people who have intermarried families to come in and be part of the community. We've now moved into mental health and now in, into these new areas as, as you so eloquently spoken about this evening. And it's how do we open up the Jewish community to say that there is nothing that's typical. Mm -hmm. and, and that you've got to be welcoming to everyone of every color and every stripe uh, within our community. If not, we're, you know, we're going to continue to shrink. But more importantly, it's, these are our, this is our flesh, this is our blood, this is our community. So you know, one of the challenges I think we all face is you know, how do we open up the community? You know, and, and I, Fran, I really appreciate your work with Keshet. I helped form a group here, in, well, supported a group here in Cleveland. We actually flew to Chicago and uh, spent time with Keshet. Uh, I mean, it just, it's, it's amazing how it, once somebody gets on the, on the, on the margins, they, they become marginalized. And we, we have to avoid that as a community. And I think that's, that's our challenge. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the ways to, to I mean, there's many ways to normalize. Um, I think actually, well, I guess what I'm hearing from you is, is, the, is how, do we, how do we normalize certain identities so that people feel like they have a place within our community? Um, part of that is reflection and leadership, um, you know, to, um, you know, I don't, you, I don't necessarily as, you know, as a member of the LGBTQ community, I don't necessarily want to be tokenized for my identity, um, you know, but as a rabbi, I've chosen to be very open about um, both my um, sexual orientation or that identity and also my identity as a convert, right, as a way of trying to normalize from the bima um, that we exist, we're here, right? Um, but it also, I think, starts, you know, at a very basic level in terms of um, who are the speakers we're bringing in? Um, who, are the, um, who are the people who appear in the stories that our children are reading? Um, you know, I think a lot, you know, the power of, it may seem like a very basic example, but the power of children's books to shape a child's identity of what they perceive as normal in the world um, I will say that I was raised at a time when I think probably every children's book I read had a white child from a heterosexual family <laughs> um, as the main character. Um, and that you can only see how that then extends right throughout our lives, that the media we consume as teenagers, um, the uh, pamphlets and brochures we put out um, in our communities, um, then the people we have sitting on panels. Um, I think about all the important work that's been done recently, for example, after the Me Too movement, right, to reject, as they call, mantles, right? Um, you know, all male panels. Um, but to also think that, you know, who are we bringing in to speak to our community? Who are the stories that we're sharing? Um, what are the voices that we're lifting up? Um, you know, uh, because really, and this was, this was actually part of Harvey Milk's drive um, in terms of creating acceptance for the LGBTQ community, um, right? As he said, the most powerful thing we can do is come out. Um, because once everybody realizes that they know somebody um, who belongs to that community and on top of that realize that we're actually pretty boring people, um, just like you, right? Um, acceptance happens. Um, 
and that's true for any group. Um, you can think about, you know, a lot of people are very uncomfortable around mental health and mental illness. Um, a lot of people are very uncomfortable around um, individuals with learning disabilities or cognitive differences because we tend to put those individuals in their, their own corner, right? Their, 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 their separate classroom, their, you know, their own, you know, their own service, their, um, and I, that is recognizing that sometimes that is for the benefit of those individuals, but um, we tend to hide these individuals in a way that then it becomes, um, you know, when you never have had exposure to somebody who moves through the world differently than you, the first time you might meet somebody who's like that, it can be really, really uncomfortable because you don't know what to do. Um, so it's about normalizing exposure. I think it's, it's just so important. Um, and that's, that's slow work. <laughs> the other thing is, you know, um, I sort of look at maybe it's a stretch, but everybody is equal. And I'm not sure in the Bible I was told uh, when I learned um, the Bible that they weren't so kind to women. And in the reform movement, when they say the Shema, they add about the three, about the women, the, patri the women over there. So in essence, they're including people. So mm -hmm. it, it may be that uh, in our conservative movement, we don't do that as much, although we obviously recognize women, but at least the reform movement adds that to many of their prayers, which means that we're all equal. And there's maybe therefore less discrimination or more openness. Any thoughts? That's, no, that's absolutely a place where we can also introduce some of these ideas as well. Um, I'm thinking about, I actually think, I'm very proud of Park Avenue, that we, we include the Imahot, and uh, it's, in the, uh, it's in the beginning of the Amidzah, right? We list out the, the um, patriarchs, but we include the matriarchs as well. Um, but it's also in other liturgies as, as well. At CBST, they had developed their own, their own Sidur um, uh, because they wanted to change some of the language to be more inclusive. Um, rather than talking about in Lachado D, um, just as the bridegroom, you know, rejoices in the bride, um, they changed it to just as the heart rejoices in love as a way of being more inclusive to the many kinds of love we might experience. I'm also thinking of a recent change I know we made at Park Avenue when we talk about the Misha Berach for Cholim, the prayer for healing for the sick, is to say anybody who is experiencing an illness of mind, body, or spirit, um, to not say that you know, it's only illnesses of body that we're thinking of, but we also recognize that people who are struggling um, mentally or people who are struggling spiritually and that they also deserve our care and attention as well. Um, so liturgy, yes, absolutely has an incredibly powerful effect on, on helping normalize and include people um, because, um, you know, it's a, I think of a teacher of mine, Rabbi Bene Lappi, who's a, a really phenomenal educator. I think he's still based in Chicago. Um, I see a nod there from our Chicagoan. Um, and she talks about donkey stories, um, which is that there are a lot of donkeys in the Tanakh. Um, we just don't really notice them because we were paying attention to the humans. But if you were a donkey reading the Tanakh, you would recognize, you would see every single donkey who appears. And you'd be able to remember where they appeared in that story and what they were doing. Um, and the same is true for, you know, her examples in particular queer identities. Um, but I think it's true for any identity. Um, when the rabbi stands up, and I think back to my first experiences in the Jewish community, and when that rabbi stood up and said, all are welcome here, welcome to Shabbat. Froze. Froze. There's yes. nothing I can do. There. I'm back. There we go. No, right. I told you it was going to happen for 30 seconds, <laughs> and it did. Um, so, you, so you can't call me a liar. Um, so, uh, Psychic. <laughs> um, well, I was saying that this rabbi used to stand up and she said, you know, what was it? No, I was going to ask Jay Steinmetz, as, as our part of our Jewish New York community, um, Jay, what do you think that we can do to promote it in the New York region? Well, I, first of all, I want to thank you, Rabbi, for your very, very uh, well-spoken um, presentation tonight. Um, I have a couple of stories I'd like to add in a minute, but to answer Dr. Mandel's question, you know, we want to do the mental uh, wellness initiative. Uh, that's something that's close to Stephen and his wife, and we wanted to promote it by donating money to a program where we could actually do these types of webinars and seminars and, and in-house uh, learning sessions. So we want to reach out to the professional community. 
Um, it's going to take a while, and I know, Stephen, you've been very, very proactive in it, and I apologize that because of the COVID that we haven't really had that much interaction based upon, you know, the, the current situation that we're living in, but it doesn't mean that it's not in the back of our minds. We talk about it throughout all of our, the executive board meetings and what have you. So what we really want to do is try to have these hands-on programs where we get professionals to the synagogues, or now that we're learning how to Zoom, we could actually do this throughout the entire region from our desks and our offices and actually make this mental health awareness um, more proactive. Um, I, again, I apologize that it hasn't really taken off as soon as we would like to, but I, I thank you, Dr. Mandel, for doing it in the background, and I thank you, Rabbi, for what you're doing for the community. And uh, it will take time, but we do want to do something um, in the near future. Hopefully, as, the, as we get back to some sense of normalcy, hopefully we'll be able to go and visit individual synagogues and men's clubs and put on these programs similar to what to do with your uh, health awareness and, and your, the programs that you did just for all different types of health, or the health initiative and hearing men's voices and what have you. So I, I will reach out to you in the near future. And Rabbi, if you could help us, I think you're a perfect candidate. You have a a wealth of knowledge and the fact that you have your social um, background, I think that would help us. But I just wanted to tell you a story and it's very, very pertinent to today. Um, 20 plus years ago, my oldest daughter was bat mitzvahed and we invited our friends and family and community. And one of those um, guests were my wife's third cousin, a young female who came with a guest. I don't remember the Parsha, but during the sermon, my rabbi actually was quoting that week's Parsha. And the, the best thing that I can remember from that Parsha was, to, sum, to summarize it, it was that a man shall be with a woman and a woman shall be with a man. And my wife's cousin, who was with her significant other, a female at the time, she felt that the rabbi was specifically speaking to her. And she was so embarrassed that she physically stood up and walked out of the synagogue. And, you know, fortunately, she didn't leave the building, but she left the sanctuary. And after the, after the services were over, I went over and talked to her. And I said, please, you know, the rabbi was not talking to you. It was just coincidental that this week's Parsha was relating to a man should be with a woman and, and, and no other way. So my question to you or my, my thought process is, 20 years ago, she was super embarrassed and she walked out. But today, I feel that um, the LGBTQ community is much more widely accepted. I know you've got a long way to go, and I know you've made major, major strides over the last 20, 30, 40 years and, and so forth. But I have a feeling that it's so much more accepted today. If you see gay guys together or lesbian women together, it's just, it's just the norm now. Do you feel as a professional and, and somebody who's living that, that I'm correct, or is that a misnomer on my part? I think you reckon, you're recognizing right, that we've come a, a really long way. Um, but again, as you said, we still have a, a ways to go. Um, you know, we, I always speak for myself, I, I live in a bubble here in New York to a degree. Um, you know, but even in New York, we still experience discrimination. You know, there's, there's still, you know, harassment happens. It's, it's rare, um, but it does happen. Um, you know, I've experienced my own life with my husband and I. Um, but generally, we're safe. Um, but the reality, and we can think of it from a mental health perspective, which is that, you know, young LGBTQ people are much, much, much more likely to attempt suicide than their heterosexual peers. And that has been a statistic that's remained true my entire life. Wow. Um, you know, and, and it means that we still have a lot of work to do in terms of um, building that acceptance. And I think part of it is the feelings of isolation I talked about earlier, that right, we're not born into families that are mostly like us. Um, and part of it, though, is work that we need to do as a society. And that's, I think it's exactly what you're saying, though, is that your, you know, uh, if it was a th third cousin felt like the rabbi was talking directly to her. Um, before, before I froze, um, I was using the positive example of that even an offhand comment of, you know, whether you're, you know, Jew or not a Jew, you belong here and you're welcome here, right? The, like, the non-Jews in the room hear that. Like, it might seem like a throwaway comment, but, like, like you hear that. Um, and um, when, you know, a young LGBTQ kid or a kid who's struggling with their sexuality turns on the TV and they see that, you know, um, certain politicians um, are actively working against their rights, 
um, you know, they, they hear that and it feels very, very personal. Um, and I think we can all think of moments in our own lives in which somebody might have made a, a throwaway comment or um, uh, somebody, um, or we might have seen something that might have not seemed significant to a lot of people in the media or the news, um, but because of who we are, um, we really resonate with it. Um, you know, I, I think of a million different examples. Um, you know, everything from, you know, a rabbi getting up on the bima and talking about like, oh, isn't it great, you know, all of your kids are going off to college and those who are like, well, you know, maybe my kid actually didn't get into college or maybe we can't afford it or maybe my kid isn't ready to go. Like, if you hear that, it feels really personal, right? Um, you know, or somebody says to somebody, oh, like, you know, yeah, you know, when the nice Jewish boy marries a nice Jewish girl, right? Immediately, right? LGBTQ people are like, well, and, you know, people in interfaith marriages are like, well, like, you know, you hear that. Um, which is not to say like we should start like right self-flagellating over all the like offhand comments we make, but just to recognize that that you know just like your cousin um, showed you know in, in her story, um, people are listening um, and the words we say are really significant. Um, and so the the work we have the road is still long, um, but like you said, we we have to celebrate our victories. Um, we've had some really amazing progress in the LGBTQ community and other communities as well, um, but we still have a lot of work to do, and I think we see that a lot in terms of the um, mental health, particularly of our youngest. Um, and then and it's also more pronounced when we talk about trans individuals and, and people of color in the LGBTQ community as well, um, who are still really, really fighting for acceptance. So, but I, I appreciate the question. I'll tell you a little, I have a little story about um, two years ago or a year and a half ago. Uh, in New York, there is an interfaith service um, which is held around uh, Hanukkah, Christmas. And the reason that it's held, from what I understand, it was being held for 80 years um, as a protest for the German um, celebration at Madison Square Garden. So every year, rabbi, um, can, uh, rabbi, priest, minister get together. And two years ago, when they had this, people were asked to get up and talk with a Jew, African-American, um, how they were discriminated against. Uh, a college girl, Jewish girl for Hillel, and discriminated. One girl got up and talked about how she was undergoing various surgical procedures um, uh, with um, uh, undergoing surgery. And then um, at some point, the priest or the rabbi said, now it's time for everybody to turn around and meet each other and everybody to say who you are. So we turned around and this girl who is, well, whether what she identifies with, said to me, how comfortable do you feel talking to me today? And, you know, I felt a little uncomfortable doing so, you know, how to name the person. And then both, she started crying and I had tears in my eyes, thinking that, boy, we're all different, but we're all here the same for the same purpose, to fight discrimination, to hate, to be equal. Um, if, as somebody said, if we can't get along down here, are we going to get along up there? So, you know, there are these programs that sort of make a difference in each of our lives. So I just thought I mentioned that. Oh, that's beautiful. I mean, you're really going back to the idea that we're all created with Selim Elohim, right? We are all reflections of the divine in some ways. And that's our, that's our common heritage, uh, no matter who we are. I think it's, it's significant that the Torah starts with the creation of everything. You know, most creation stories that come out of the ancient Near East at that time focus on the creation of a single city and a single people. The Babylonians talk about Babylon, Sumerians talk about Sumer, right? But we start with the creation of everybody and we have this profound statement at the beginning of our, of our most holy document, right? Which is that all people, not just Jews and not just people we like and not just people who are easy to get along with, right? All people are created but Selim Elohim. Um, I think so, the Bible, uh, in some way, please correct me, that said man should not l lay down with men, but mm -hmm. I, but it doesn't say woman should not lay down with women. That's true. That's true. Probably because the Bible is heavily influenced by um, <laughs> men who are concerned with their own issues. It's still a challenge we have in our tradition as well, right? The rabbinic tradition is largely male dominated. And so cultivating space for um, non-male voices is still important work that we have to do. Um, but absolutely, right? And it's important to, to understand the context within which those passages were written. And I understand that many of us come from different um, backgrounds in terms of observance, in terms of um, uh, whether more conservative, more progressive, um, you know, but uh, I think first and foremost, and this is actually, I think, the beautiful work I've been seeing recently in the Orthodox community has been 
um, even while holding a more small c conservative approach to Torah um, and the context within which it was written, um, are starting to try to lift up the part of LGBTQ people that is B'Tselem Elohim. Um, and that's, uh, so we see movement even there. And I think that's, uh, that that foundation, um, uh, which is truly the foundation of our tradition, um, because it's the very, very beginning of it, um, it, it serves I think, as a really powerful tool uh, for, for connecting with others um, across lines of difference. Can I ask the other people who are on this call, if, uh, what sort of, what, what is their takeaway from all this? Les and, you know, Irv and everybody else. Steve, if I, if I could say something, I'm Don Sable from Elkins Park, uh, right outside of Philadelphia. Yeah, we, lived, um, we were members of Har Zion for 30 years. Oh, wonderful. I'm at Beth yeah. Shalom and have been for a long, long time, and uh, things are doing somewhat well and okay in Elkins Park. Uh, Rabbi, you mentioned about folks who are marginalized and, not, and those who are not marginalized, uh, and the concerns for those in our society who are marginalized. And I want to throw out the idea, and something I'm very sad and upset about, that while the Jewish community is not marginalized, anti-Semitism in America today is marginalized. And I live in Philadelphia, you know, we recently had a football player who passed along in, on Instagram to maybe one to two million followers, some vicious, ugly stuff. And Mitch Album, if you want to read about it, Mitch Album wrote a great article giving the details about it. And I'm just upset that we see anti-Semitism spreading. We see Louis Farrakhan saying things being followed. And what I'm most upset about is the lack of a response from our organized Jewish community. And I would say the only Jewish community on a national level that speaks for me is ZOA and who fights against it. And I would say the ADL, which I did some volunteer work for in Los Angeles in like 1980 when I was in law school, had a program with Al Sharpton, which was shocking. Uh, I would say, in, I just want to throw out one other thing, Rabbi, because you might know a lot of these folks, Rabbi Philip. In 2017, there were about 200 Jews in the community, largely in New York and elsewhere, who signed a letter in support of, in support of Linda Sarsour when she was being attacked by various folks, which was fine. But they ended that letter in 2017, and I'm coming to my conclusion, we look forward to working with you, et cetera, et cetera. To me, you don't work with somebody who's a known anti-Semite. And I, as one who is a serious student of history, am seeing this growth of anti-Semitism on college campuses. And in a nutshell, we are national Jewish organizations are asleep at the wheel. And I just wanted to throw out to this group that I'm just upset by it. And I think it's something we should talk about at every meeting of Jews, uh, you know, when we're organizing something to see what we could do about it. And it's not going to get better if we don't push back. That's my comment. Thank you. I mean, at, uh, as Rabbi Philip could indicate, um, one of his colleagues, Rabbi Kasrov, is, um, I would think, uh, I'm clearly a leader in this area to promote, um, to promote um, everything that you were saying on a repeated basis to our congregation in New York. Well, I'm actually thinking a lot of um, uh, the recent sermon that Rabbi Kasrov gave, which used, I think, the Deshaun Jackson um, uh, <laughs> issue um, or the, the, uh, as, a, as an example of how we can engage, right? And I was thinking actually, um, right, people instead of, I think, uh, and there's a lot to be said about um, kind of recent cultural moves to um, excise or attempt to simply silence and push aside individuals who say um, difficult or even um, reprehensible things. Um, but the amazing thing about Deshaun Jackson is that people um, chose to pursue dialogue um, you had both um, non-Jews and Jews. Um, my mom sent me the uh, video of Julian Edelman um, reaching out to him um, because she's a, a Pats fan. Um, we're from California. I don't know why. Don't ask. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, of him reaching out for dialogue. And I, you know, I now know that, you know, um, Deshaun Jackson is engaging in dialogue with various people, um, both from within the Black community and also um, I think recently he agreed to meet with a, a survivor of Auschwitz. Um, and so I think that that's, it's, it's hard uh, and people, and people can, can take stances um, and can pursue political aims that are really, are really, really um, difficult to swallow, um, if not ones that we need to condemn um, vociferously. Um, 
I think we also need to reach back into our tradition and recognize that even those people, right, are reflections of God in some way. Um, and that also we, you know, we don't live in a, as much as we might like to, we don't live in a world necessarily of um, completely good people and completely bad people. We're all very complicated. And um, we ourselves, each of us is morally inconsistent sometimes. Um, you know, I'm a, you know, very environmentally conscious vegetarian who used a plastic straw this morning, right? Like we make inconsistent decisions. I know that might seem banal compared to, um, you know, the evil that is anti-Semitism. Um, but what I really loved about this Sean Jackson um, situation is that people chose to see the part of him that was still B'Tsel Malohim and said, you know, I'm going to hold on to that. And I'm going to engage with you as much as I can. I'm going to... I'm going to be unequivocal in my condemnation of what was said that was wrong, right? It's not to say that that's okay and like whatever, we're going to dismiss it. Um, but I'm also going to, in addition to pursuing justice, I'm going to balance that with the compassion and understanding that you're a person who can change um, and that education is an incredibly powerful tool for change. Um, and we need to be persistent, I think, in holding both, holding both that justice and that compassion together. Um, and this is maybe a perfect like kind of plug for the high holidays, not that we necessarily need it, but right, that we're told, right, God sits on the throne of Dean and the throne of Rachamim. Um, you know, God sits on the throne of both judgment and the throne of compassion and forgiveness. And so how do we as human beings hold both um, when we approach these situations to say, um, I recognize that anti-Semitism comes from that same ignorant and thoughtless place as so many other ills in our society, um, racism and homophobia, transphobia, I think are all coming from this, this um, you know, kind of pit of ignorance, if you will. Um, and how do we you know, um, hold that um, and say, I'm gonna reach out a hand to help pull you out of that pit while also saying, but we have to recognize that what you did was wrong and depending on what the action was, hold people accountable for those actions as well. Um, it's not easy and we're not gonna always get it right. Um, and people are not going to always change the first, second, third, fifth, fiftieth, hundredth time that we attempt um, to help them along that path. Um, but right, the, it's not, it's not uh, you know, upon us to finish the work, but neither are we at liberty to desist from it. Um, the wisdom of our tradition is still there. And as frustrating as it might be sometimes, um, it still calls us, I think, to, um, to approach people with both that, that love and compassion and also that sense of justice and what is right as well. So um, I think we've reached um, the end Remember, of our I was hour say one together. Thing. Yeah, the beauty, sure. the beauty of the, the uh, and there is no beauty in it, but the response to Deshaun Jackson came from his peers. It mm -hmm. came from Julian Edelman, whose father was Jewish, who's now becoming Jewish, has written Jewish children's books, and Mitchell Schwartz, who is a, who's lived, lives a committed Jewish life, uh, all-star, I mean, all-pro uh, guard for the Kansas City Chiefs. They're the ones who responded in kind, plus the fact that Robert Kraft, the owner of the uh, Patriots, has brought a number of NFL players to Israel. I've uh, actually stumbled across some of them, and, and privately and publicly, a number of them have started to respond to him. So it, it, it was a response that, that not, it's not coming from the, on top, it's coming from his peers saying, uh-uh, you gotta, you gotta watch this. And I think that's you know, one of the things we have to be, you know, it was an appropriate response, I think. What's the exposure Jewish principle? Ball players. Tom, you're saying Jewish ball players. I was disappointed in the lack of condemnation by African American ball players. Uh, Towards and, them as well. I'm thinking uh, of the uh, other individual's last name was Jackson as well. I'm, I'm, I feel bad that I'm forgetting his first name, but he sat down and had a conversation with him as well. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers that individual's name. It was also a Jackson. Um, but you're right. I think, expo and, but you're also talking to the idea of exposure as well. Right, um, right. That's some, one of our most powerful tools in any scenario. We talked about it earlier with the with the Harvey Milk example. We talked about it with the example of meeting and interacting with people with um, learning differences and cognitive differences and, and who struggle with mental illness as well. Um, you know, right. That that kind of exposure it begins to chip away at our prejudices and our discomfort um, and our learned ignorances. Um, you know, I, I profoundly believe that we can unlearn those ignorances, um, but it, it takes time. It takes a long time. Um, to do that sometimes, and um, so how do we hold how do we hold patience and love with also the sense of justice as well? And I think that um, you know it's Don's point as well. Like it's okay for us to also call out you know the institutions that are supposed to be representing us um, when um, and our leaders as well when they're not um, you know standing up for 
uh, for that call to justice. And I would also hope that we do the same when we see people um, pursuing justice and judgment um, with no compassion and no hope for change as well. And to constantly try to balance those two, and it's not, it's not easy. Um, Bye. Uh, thank you very much. You've given us a, a great deal to think about, but even more importantly, to act upon in the days, weeks, and months ahead. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you all so much. Feel, feel free to reach out to me. Um, if you have more thoughts, want to talk more, um, all my contact information is on the um, Park Avenue Synagogue website. If you just look under our clergy and um, hopefully I will see you um, on Zoom somewhere in the near future and in person, um, God willing, um, soon when it is safe. Um, but many blessings for health, um, health and safety and um, the comfort of loved ones um, in these coming months. Rabbi, can I ask you a Thank you. Thank you. Rabbi, can I ask you just one question? Sure, sure. Uh, one I'm more sorry question. To keep, I'm sorry to keep this going longer than it's probably supposed to, but it's very, very entertaining for me and enlightening more than, more than entertaining. Um, first of all, I, I apologize for getting on the, the Zoom conference a few minutes late. Your name is Rabbi Philp or Philip? Philip. How do you pre say that again? It's Philip, P-H-I-L-P, one I. Phil. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's number one. And number two, if you look at the faces on this screen, you're considerably younger than all of us looking at you right now. Um, I know rabbis are very learned on the Talmud and the Torah and the Bible, but a lot of rabbis are not knowledgeable how to talk to younger people with similar situations that you're living through right now. Is it possible? Are you acceptable to the fact that we could refer these kids who may be struggling to talk to their own rabbis who don't have an answer to, to reach out to you and maybe you can give them guidance? Absolutely, no, absolutely. Um, okay. and, that's, and that's why one of the reasons why I'm very public about my identities as part of the LGBTQ community and also as a convert as well, um, because I think that um, I owe a lot to the people who um, I could talk to about these things on, on both a personal level and on a level of, I think, mutual understanding. Um, so I'm always, always happy uh, to connect with people. And so um, send them my way. Um, Wonderful. Like said, it'd, be, it'd be great to connect. But yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Excellent well, job. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Great. Have Good a wonderful, night, wonderful evening. Thank Good you. Night. Good night.